Good afternoon and welcome to today's Tiger webinar. I am Lydia Palmer, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications in RIT's Division of Development and Alumni Relations, and I am your moderator for today's webinar. Thank you very much for your patience. We are still working on a small technical issue trying to get Dr. Osgood uh, linked into the webinar, but we are going to begin with Dr. Hudson. Uh, so we will start and join um, in with Dr. Osgood later. Uh, we are happy to have you all with us today, and we hope that our entire Tiger family is well and weathering the store, this, this global challenge. We want you to know that the RIT Office of Alumni Relations is available to help all Tigers in the coming weeks with a variety of needs, including new virtual content, learning opportunities, and networking and career assistance in the coming months as our workplaces and our world work through the post-pandemic realities. We especially encourage everyone to connect to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, where you will find up-to-date communications and opportunities to connect with other Tiger alumni in your region and your industry. We will post those links into the chat box shortly. Uh, the chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of your webinar window. Our class of 2020 is finishing their time at RIT, but they are just beginning their journey into the lives of purpose for which their RIT education and experiences have prepared them. As a Tiger for Life, uh, we need your help to welcome our graduates to the alumni body and encouraging them, as, encouraging them as both professionals and people in their next chapters. If you have words of wisdom, advice, or encouragement for our new band of Tigers, please share your thoughts with them at rit.edu slash alumni slash tiger dash wisdom. We also want to ask you to join us on May 8th as we celebrate our class of 2020 virtually. We will be streaming a virtual celebration on May 8th at 5 p.m. at www.rit.edu slash class of 2020. As you're aware, our soon-to-be uh, fellow alumni won't be able to celebrate the way many of us did with a week of formal commencement ceremonies. So let's make this virtual event special until they can come back together for something more official. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students and the university during this unprecedented situation, and we are incredibly grateful for those offers. Because a pandemic like COVID-19 touches us all, a global day of giving, hashtag Giving Tuesday Now, has been set up for Tuesday, May 5th, in response to the unprecedented need caused by the virus. As generosity has the power to unite and heal communities, RIT will be participating in this fundraising event to bring our community together in support of our students. You can get a head start by making a gift at the link that is in the chat box, and we thank you all very much. We want to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the presentation tools. If you are joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the transmission. The webinar platform is secure and does not require VPN access. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions for our panel can be entered in the chat box at any time throughout the discussion. We will make every effort to address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. You are joining the event using broadcast audio. If you wish to dial in by phone, dial-in information is provided in the chat box. Live captioning is also being provided, and you can find the link to access that in the chat box as well. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available, complete with captions, in approximately one week following the event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And now on to our webinar. We are happy to welcome Dr. Andre Hudson. Uh, he is the head of the Thomas Gosnell School of Life Sciences at RIT, and Dr. Robert Osgood, who is the program director and an associate professor in biomedical sciences program. Dr. Hudson is trained as a biochemist, and the major themes of his research are vested in biochemistry and microbiology, more specifically in the areas of amino acid metabolism, structural analysis of enzymes involved in amino acid and bacterial, <laughs> pep, I'm sorry, pep, peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan metabolism, is that correct? 
uh, peptidoglycan. There we go. Thank you. And the isolation, identification, and genomic characterization of plant-associated bacteria. Dr. Hudson has secured approximately $1.3 million in federally funded grants and contracts as principal investigator or co-PI for the NIH, NSF, Bayer Corporation, Sweetwater Energy, and NatCore Technology. Dr. Hudson has published 43 peer review articles and presented more than 28 conference presentations in addition to 29 invited talks. Dr. Osgood, as I said, is the program director and an associate professor in the Bio Biomedical Sciences program of RIT's Institute of Health Sciences and Technology. Dr. Osgood enjoyed a 23-year career as a medical technologist before joining RIT. Following a 3.5-year postdoctoral fellowship in oral microbiology at University at Buffalo, he came to RIT. I'm sorry, that may not be University at Buffalo, it's UAB. He came to RIT, noted for his student teaching, noted for his student teaching, motivation, and mentoring. His research has been published in several scientific journals. Dr. Hud Drs. Hudson and Osgood, we are very glad to have you with us today. As I did say, we are going to continue to try and get Dr. Osgood uh, linked up here into the webinar, but we will begin with Dr. Hudson. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Leah. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's my first time doing um, um, a webinar like this um, remotely. Um, so. Um, thank you very much. So in my lab, one of the major themes in my lab as a biochemist is to basically look for new targets for antibiotic development. And so the story, I'll tell you two quick stories today, uh, kind of two different approaches that we're taking um, in my lab. And one of the cool things um, I'd like to share is that about 95% of what I'll show you today uh, was done with the, uh, with the help of undergraduate students. Um, so uh, no PhD students, um, one postdoc and uh, one master's student, but about 95% of what I'm going to show you today was done by undergraduate students in my lab. All right. So um, <clears throat> Lydia already introduced me, so I won't go into detail, but I joined RIT um, 12 years ago um, after a postdoctoral stint at Rutgers University. Um, and at Rutgers, one of the major themes um, in the, the departments or the the culture of, uh, of which I was trained um, is a bi deep seated biochemistry uh, related research related to antibiotics at Rutgers. They have the, the Salman Waxman, um, the Waxman Institute of Microbiology, um, um, denoted to uh, Professor Salman Waxman, who would discovered um, streptomycin um, several decades ago, which um, was helpful in combating um, bacterial diseases. Right, so why are we here? Well, the, the main reason why we're here is that there is a, what we call the discovery board. So if you look at this um, of schematics of, of, of I'm showing you here, the major problem is that, you know, in the, in the early 40s, 50s, 60s, and in the mid 70s or so, we developed a whole lot of antibiotics um, um, to treat many different. So there were narrow spectrum antibiotics or broad spectrum. And by narrow spectrum, I mean, you know, they only um, treated or were earmarked to certain bacteria versus broad spectrum antibiotics, which killed a lot of bacteria. If you notice um, the arrow, um, there is what we call the discovery void. And the reason is that between the mid 70s uh, up until the late 90s or so, there were really not a lot of uh, research going on into antibiotic development for several reasons. Number one is that the, the, the legacy drugs worked very well. And so there was really no need um, for, for antibiotics development. And also it was a financial, um, um, constraints, meaning that um, companies really weren't making a lot of money developing antibiotics or the prospects weren't there, so they figured we didn't do it. But at the same time that this has been going on, uh, evolution, which is a natural phenomenon, um, was still going on, right? And so uh, we continue to get bacterial infections, those bacteria continue to evolve mechanisms to circumvent what we call clinically relevant antibiotics. And so now here we are, where we um, have problems with a lot of diseases that are resistant or bacteria that are resistant to commonly used antibiotics, right? So the Centers for the Disease Control and Prevention, right, um, predicts that each year about 2.8 million people get infected with bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics and roughly about 35,000 people die from these um, bacterial infections, 
So this research is relevant uh, because the number of multi-drug resistant bacteria such as MRSA or methicillin resistant staph aureus, versa, vancomycin, uh, resistant staph aureus, pseudomonas originalis, and a whole slew of um, organisms are have become or developing resistance to antibiotics. In addition, the, re the research is also relevant because there are a lot of what we call emerging infections that we don't even know existed yet. So kind of think about the position that we're in now with COVID-19 as of something just appear. And now instead of being proactive, now we are reacting to um, this disease that's going on, right? So the research in my lab is basically um, looking for new targets for um, drug development, as this is one of the bottlenecks in first coming up with um, new drugs, right? So I hypothesize that inhibition of enzymes, specifically, I won't, I will call it DAP-L for now. So this enzyme called DAP-L, which is a diaminophimolate aminotransferase, um, that is uh, a path uh, enzyme in some um, pathogenic bacteria, will cause a bactericidal or cell death due to if you inhibit this particular enzyme, because this enzyme is involved in two what we call primary metabolism pathways, which is cell wall or peptidoglycan biosynthesis and also protein synthesis. So the enzyme is involved in making cell wall and also involved in making an amino acid called lysine, which is used in protein synthesis, right? Um, the rationale is that about 13% of the bacterial genomes have this one particular pathway or use this one particular enzyme. So it will be a narrow spectrum antibiotic, right? And it has a role in cell wall biosynthesis, as I said, and it also has a role in lysine biosynthesis by amino acid biosynthesis in general, right? So all living things, right? Um, um, uses these 20 building blocks um, to make proteins. Right, so protein is a polymer made up of these individual subunits, building blocks called amino acids. And humans, or all animals for that matter, can only make 11 out of the 20 that we need to survive, right? So um, we can't make valine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, histidine, methionine, threonine, et cetera. And I'm honing in on this one particular amino acid called lysine. Right. So lysine is um, in nature is basically synthesized from two different methods, right? One uses uh, from the um, glycolysis, all right, all the way how we break down sugars into making energy, all right? We make a, a compound called homocitrate. Um, homocitrate makes a compound called alpha amino adipate or AAA, yes. and then that gets converted through a series of steps to lysine, and that only occurs in fungi and in some archaeal species. The majority of organisms uh, related to bacteria, algae, plants, and a few um, archaea uses a different pathway where they use um, the citrate cycle. Um, they make another amino acid called aspartate, and from aspartate, um, you make diaminopimolate, and through a series of reactions, you make lysine. And this is very important because lysine is essential because humans cannot make lysine. So every single lysine molecule that we get in our bodies to make proteins, either we get it from um, primarily plants, right? So either the chicken eat corn, right? And we eat the chicken, and that's how we get lysine um, to be um, to be made. Right? Okay. Right, so here I'm showing you. Hey Rob, do you mind muting maybe? Yes, we're working on that now. Yes. Yeah. So if you just hover down, okay. Thanks. So if you look at um um. Um, uh, what I'm showing you above is this kind of feedback loop of how um, organisms basically control the amount of lysine that is made. And the reason why we were interested in lysine from the beginning was that lysine, along with methionine and a few other amino acids, are limited in cereal crops, right? So we don't, for example, in rice and wheat and corn and barley, um, they have to be fortified with exogenous lysine in order to be good livestock feed, for example. So we were interested in, in first to find out how plants synthesize lysine so we could manipulate the pathway to basically um, do through biotechnology for plants to make excess amount of lysine and methionine and some other amino acids, right? So as a biochemist, this, um, this chart is very fascinating to me. I won't go into super detail, but as I said, you know, um, the, that, the DAP pathway, the diaminopimolate pathway first starts out with aspartate and through a series of reactions, you end up making lysine, 
And one of the compounds, right, um, is branched off to make peptidoglycan by synthesis, right? So the, that pathway occurs in three steps. The first part is to how do you convert glycine aspartate to this compound we call THDP, right? And you use these arrows or basically enzymatic steps to do that. So here is a, a series of four enzymatic steps go from aspartate to THDP, right? And then the second part of the step is how do you go from THDP to this penultimate compound called mesodiaminopimylate or MDAC, right? So through a series of reactions, different organisms convert it differently. So in one, for example, in the what I'm showing you in A, this is how E. coli will do it, right? What I'm showing you in B, this is how uh, an organism called Carinobacterium will do it. Actually, Carinobacterium is the organism that is used predominantly to make exogenous lysine by fermentation, right, that we use to add to um, livestock feed. And actually lysine is a commodity, right? It's, you could, in other amino acids, you could make it and trade it um, because of its, its, its necessity for life. And we discovered a new pathway we call the DAP-L pathway, and we discovered how plants make lysine via this one particular uh, enzyme called DAP-L, right? So here is the, um, <clears throat> the third part of the pathway is basically how now you get from mesodap to lysine and all organisms that uses the DAP pathway do this by basically a decarboxylation. So if you look at MDAP and you look at lysine, the only difference is you don't have a carboxyl group. And so this enzyme called lys A removes the carboxyl group to make lysine. Okay. So here is the, the pathway, here is the DAP pathway um, in general. Um, and what we notice is that, what we noticed um, for, um, in plants was that we could find all of these, the top part of the pathway, so aspartate kinase, aspartate semialdehyde dehydrogenase, the DAP A, the DAP B, we could find DAP F, we could find lys A, but we could never find these three core genes, DAP D, DAP C, and DAP E. So I asked the question, how does plants or other organisms that don't have the E. coli pathway, how do they bridge the what I call the metabolic gap between THDP and LDAP? Right, right. <clears throat> and so I figured that it's the enzyme was an amino transferase. And so here's what we did. We took E. coli and I basically removed these genes in E. coli. And if you remove these two genes because the organism can't make lysine and can't make um, cell wall, the organism will die because those two things are very, very important for life to occur from the bacterial point of view. Well, for all life in general. Right? And so here is an example of a technique called functional complementation. What I'm doing is I'm using the DAP-L version of the enzyme or gene from a plant, right? So AT means Arabidopsis thaliana, that's a plant. CR is for um, um, Chlamydomonas reinhardii, that's an alga. And VS is V spinosum, which is from a bacteria. So what I did was I took those genes, what I thought were DAP-L genes, and I basically fuse them to another piece of DNA called a plasmid, and then I put it back into the mutant, right? And if I feed it what it's missing, so and plus DAP, then everything grows. But if I take the DAP away, only the organ, only the bacteria that has a version of these genes is able to grow in DAP-free media, meaning that the gene now is circumventing or producing the, mole the molecule that is missing when I'm not feeding it the substrate that is missing, right? Right. In addition, what we did was we looked at this gene. Uh, first, it was discovered in plants. And what we did was we looked at it in plants. And so it's very important. I don't want to go through this in detail. But what I want to show you is these little ar this arrow right here where you see this little seed that's underdeveloped here. This is a phenomenon called embryolethality. And the reason why I'm showing it to you here is because I know from this test, I could tell that the gene and subsequently the enzyme is essential for the plants to develop because here is a, a, is a seed that has two basically mutant copies of the gene and it's dead, right? Whereas these other um, um, healthy looking seeds will able to grow. And you could test this by basically getting a mutant plant, basically pop open the fruit, what is called a salique. These are like peas in a pod and you could basically count, right? So then you could see by about a quarter of the seeds um, from these what we call um, heterozygous plants Right, have two mutant copies of the gene, and so the plant is dead. So the the the, the enzyme or the gene is useful, in, in for plants. So because the the gene is essential from a plant perspective, we could target this enzyme as a herbicide. From an algae perspective, we could target this gene as an algicide, and from a bacterial perspective, we could target this gene as an antibiotic. 
or enzyme is an antibiotic, right? So I'm using this organism in our lab called Verical Microbium Spinosum. Um, here's why I'm using it. It's free living. It's from a, a super phylum called the Plantomyxes Verical Microbium Chlamydia clade. It's non-pathogenic to humans, and it is the closest free living relative to organisms um, that causes um, the sexual transmitted disease, um, chlamydia. So um, um, chlamydia trachomatis is the organism that causes the chlamydia um, STD. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things is by chemists, what I, um, one of the things we are getting, we do in our lab is structural biology. And here's how we do it, right? I was able to take this particular gene put it into a, a, a vector or, or a piece of DNA, and I basically hijacked the E. coli system to make the protein for me. So basically use the E. coli machinery for protein synthesis to make the protein for me. And if you look at a, a figure A, right, um, here, if you look at, say, lane three versus lane six, basically I what I did was I put a piece of tag, I tagged the protein with a piece of um, uh, amino acid sequence that I could then use to pull the protein out of the soup. So basically I'm taking that one ingredient and pulling it out of the soup to purify the protein, right? So now, now that I have a very, very pure protein in the lane six, right? I could do a process called crystallography. Now here's how crystallography works. I take the protein in solution. It's no different than if you take salt and water right, you mix it in an aqueous solution, and then I'm going to evaporate or remove the water from this solution, then what I'm gonna leave left with is the crystal. And so here in this, in the figure that has these little glass-like um, uh, molecules is actually the crystals of the protein. So basically I'm taking the protein that is in water, right, and I'm removing all the water, concentrating the protein down to its crystal, its crystalline form, right? Then this little spotty uh, picture at the bottom, is here is what is called a diffraction pattern. And so I'm using extra crystallography to cast, um, um, to get um, the pattern, the x-ray pattern. And so what happened is that if it's like, it's no different than if I hold up a uh, my fist in front of a light, right, or I made the bunny ears in front of the light, what happened is that it's the light is going to bounce off around the areas that is blocking that light and it's going to cast a shadow. Right, and then the question I'm asking is, can I use the shadow to recreate the image that was used to cast a shadow? Right. So this is what a crystallography is: is these spots here, right, are basically diffractions around X-ray diffractions around the crystal that was used to cast a shadow, and then I'm going to use a computer software to render these dots into cast into basically rendering a three-dimensional image that was used to cast this particular shadow. Right. And so here's what the enzyme looked like. Right. So the enzyme, so this is a picture of the enzyme and it was solved at 2.25 angstroms, right? So this is um, highly, highly resolution. So basically the 2.5 angstrom resolution is akin to a picture with good DPI, right? It has good resolution, right? So basically I could zoom, I could zoom in and still get resolution from this particular picture. So if you look at the enzyme, you can see it has two active sites. And then what we asked in the question is, can we basically use the active sites or can I look into the lock of the enzyme, right? And can I design a fake key that will fit into the active site, preventing the enzyme from working? What I mean is, can I prevent this enzyme from making lysine? Can I prevent, which is an amino acid that's needed for life? And can I prevent it from making peptidoglycan, which is used for cell wall biosynthesis, right? And so here um, I'm zooming in now, so from, from this, image, I'm zooming in to this particular image, and these are the amino acids, right, that makes up the active site. So this is uh, the, basically the, the, the lock mechanism of this particular enzyme. So these are the, um, the amino acids that make the little pocket that's going to bind the substrate for the enzyme to work. Okay. So what we did now is that we basically challenged this enzyme, basically have the enzyme in its pure form, and I'm basically going to challenge it with a lot of different keys, a lot of different what we call pseudo substrates, basically compounds that are not natural substrates. So they can't, the enzyme is not going to use them, but I'm hoping that it could bind and prevent the enzyme from working. So here is we challenge this particular enzyme with about 30,000 different compounds, right? And out of the 30,000, we got basically four that worked. 
And how we know that it works is basically I'm measuring something called the IC50 value. The IC50 value or the inhibitor constant is the amount of substrate or the amount of antagonist or the amount of a compound, right, that I could add to an enzyme and basically cut the efficiency in half, right? So good drugs, right, you want a low number, you want a low IC50 value. That means I don't have to give you a lot of drugs for the for the drugs to work the higher the ic50 value right you have toxicity issues etc because that means i have to force feed you the drug in order for it to work right so if you look at uh, these different compounds hydrazide rhodonine barbiturate thibarbiturate these are what we call lead compounds meaning that i could basically take these four compounds and basically scaffold different molecules on them right, to make different drugs in order for the enzyme to work. And you can see that they have good IC50, IC50 values. For example, the hydrazide has an IC50 value of 47. And for example, the thiobarbituate have an IC50 value of 5.7. That means I could you only take 5.7 micromolar amount of this one particular drug or one particular compound, right, to basically cut the enzyme activity in half. So if you double that, that means you will basically remove all activity from the enzyme. Okay. So here are just some um, some references for one uh, for this portion of the work. Uh, real quick, I'll uh, go through another approach that we're using in our lab, which is basically identify bacteria that have are endowed with activities to kill other bacteria. And so recently, we embarked on a project where we basically query the soil. We basically went to the soil on campus, actually as undergraduate students basically went on campus and grabbed some soil, brought it back to the lab, and we basically isolated. We did a whole a series of, um, of tasks, and we found two bacteria that we're calling RIT 592 and RIT 594 that we, that we show have activities, basically um, um, produces compounds to kill bacteria. And so here, um, here is a, a, a is one of these bacteria 592, right? It has this kind of yellow um, tinge um, to it. And B, we're showing that different amounts of organisms. So um, in spot one in, in panel B is basically tetracycline. So we, it is a common known antibiotics that we know should kill the bacteria. So it does work. And spot two, three, four, five, and six are basically increase, increasing amounts in a titer, in a titration assay, looking at the more of this, um, uh, what we call exuate, what, what, what the organism is pushing out to the environment, the more of this pushing out, it has the capability um, to kill um, the bacteria, in this case, E. coli. And C and D are just kind of high resolution SEM, scanning electron micrographs of this one particular, of these two particular bacteria that are five. So 594 is the rod and five, uh, 592 is the rod and 594 is the round coxide that you see here. So we kind of did this mixing when we see that. And um, the chromatogram here, right, um, in A and B, um, 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 to the right of this chart, showing you that we basically queried the organism and find out how much, what compounds are you producing, right? So um, in 592, we find that it's producing 104 compounds, unique compounds. In 594, we find out it's that it's producing 45 compounds. And out of these mixture, they actually have about 46 of them or so in, 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 in common, right? So then what we did was we took these compounds that we isolated, um, we went in and isolated the in individual compounds from these bacteria. And we show that a library of these compounds actually kill what we call a time kill assay. Basically we grow, um, these are MRSA, um, e. coli that have um, MCR or multiple um, clonal resistance, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So these are clinically relevant strains that are known to be resistant to antibiotics. So these were actually strains that were from a hospital setting, right, that, that were known to be resistant. And what we did is we're showing that when we add our compounds produced by these two bacteria, right, you could see that uh, at growth control, the bacteria grows in the black, it grows as normal. And if we titrate one X, one half X, one X and two X, you see a decrease in the amount of bacteria over time, showing that our bacteria producing compounds to kill um, the bacteria, right? So another question we have is does, does quorum sensing in um, 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 control how much 
compounds the bacteria make. And so quorum sensing is a mechanism by which how bacteria talk to each other. So just like I'm talking to you now using words, right? Bacteria have their own language, but instead of words, they use compounds. And what the bacteria does is produce these one set of these compounds called homoserine lactones. And basically it uses it to make decision. So the more bacteria you have, density dependence, the more density you have or more bacteria you have, it's going to produce more homoserine lactone. The more homoserine lactone is in the environment, then the bacteria coordinates its activity. For example, if you only get infected with one bacterium, right, then that bacterium is going to want to call itself and flag itself in real time to the system because then the system will, the immune system will, you know, uh, overcome that one particular bacteria and kill it. So what the bacteria do is they multiply, 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 and then use the quorum sensing, right, the AHL, these homoserine lactones, and then tell, okay, now that we have a population of 10 million, now it's time to attack. Right now, it has a better strategy to circumvent the natural immune responses of organism that way. So here, we could basically these blue spots are basically signals that I could tell that are being made by our bacteria. And so the question we have is, can we now use quorum sensing? Can we fool these bacteria into thinking that there's many of them around to produce a lot more antibiotic compounds? to in order that we could purify them? So it's a mechanism to basically fool the bacteria to produce a lot more compounds than it will naturally um, produce um, in the setting, right? So in our lab, we do structural biology, biochemistry, microbiology. There's a lot of bioinformatics. Um, we do some environmental work by going out into the environment and querying the, the, the environment for ba basically bi what we call bioprospecting. It's basically going out to the environment to find useful organisms. Right, and um, what I'm showing you here, just basically a subset of the enzyme that my lab has been involved in, sol in solving the crystal structure of these. Some of these are algicides, herbicides, or antibiotics, and so we do that in our lab, right? Um, I would like to acknowledge a whole slew of individuals, um, particularly all my students, um, student colleagues here, my collaborators, um, particular the funding agencies, um, RIT, and the School of Life Sciences. Um, and I thank you guys very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing some questions. Thank you very much. So, Rob, I'll turn it over to you, or I could answer a few questions if um, um, if that's okay, Lydia. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, what have you like? Oh, my goodness. My goodness. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, if the two of you wouldn't mind muting, let me just uh, sure. address. Uh, Jim Perkins had a question. Um, the first one is that he said, is your DAPL model deposited in the RCSB protein data bank. And if you do, do you know what the ID number is? He thinks maybe you just answered that for him. Actually, um, yeah, so the pro the protein has been deposited into the um, the protein data bank um, and uh, have uh, it will be published soon. So they don't release it until the paper is published. So we have a paper in review now. And once the paper is reviewed, then they will officially release the, the PDB number. And then he also says uh, that you said that you tested 30,000 compounds to see which yep. ones bound to the DAPL model. Yes. Did you uh, do this using a virtual docking program? Um, no, this is what actually done um, in using in vitro assays, using a high throughput um, screening system um, um, in vitro assays. So not um, it wasn't um, done in silico, it was done in vitro. Terrific, okay. thank you so much. Um, we are going to now welcome Dr. Osgood, who we are very glad we could finally get him connected in. Um, and just to let our, our audience know, we may run a little bit over the five o'clock mark. That's fine with us. We hope you'll stick around and uh, uh, get through to the end of the uh, presentation because I'm sure it's going to continue to be just as fascinating. So Dr. Osgood, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to load up your presentation and you can go ahead. Well, this is great. I'm so so glad that we could get connected, literally. Um, one of the things I want to use as a backdrop to sort of bring a different dimension to uh, the notion of antibiotics is uh, the element of biofilms. But before I get into it, let me quickly say that, uh, Andre, I really appreciate the work that you did uh, using those antagonistic assays to show, uh, you know, proof that microbes can indeed fight microbes. I've always said that no one knows the microbiology, microbiology of an area than microbes that are living in that area. So that's that's a great way to show that. But um, th this notion of biofilms as it pertains to antibiotics goes all the way back to me when I was still working in the labs in MedTech. I used to notice that some people who had Pseudomonas aeruginosa in their, in their um, 
sputum samples. Um, very, very rarely did someone who was of age come out of that uh, with, with a great outcome. They would either get worse or they would die. And I began to wonder what was going on with that. And so I got into graduate school as a result of, of that question. And uh, you'll see some of the work here that helped me understand what was really going on. So uh, that's sort of as a backdrop uh, as you hear what I'm about to say about biofilm. So if we move a little bit further to the next slide, I think we can get um, a little bit further into uh, what we're doing. Um, yeah, we go. And so what is a biofilm? I like to tell people that a biofilm is really a community. It's a bunch of organisms, either of the same species, or it can actually be, and more likely will be, a community of organisms of mixed species. And so by definition, I like this one. It's a thin layer of microbial growth on living or non-living surfaces. They have a choice uh, that mature that means they're going to grow and develop further into an exopolysaccharide. They're going to produce this and get themselves encased and form finally some 3D aggregates. And so that's a mouthful. But what it really means is that it's a bunch of microbes who have decided to live together as a community on some surface, living or non-living. And then they grow up and they develop into 3D aggregates. And that in itself um, is, is very impressive uh, for microbes. And we can see this with uh, bacteria. The fungi do it. Uh, there are algal species that do it as well. And then even the exopolysaccharide material itself can be diverse. It's not always one and the same thing. It just depends on the environment that the organisms are in. So um, some examples of biofilm, some that you've actually seen before and very familiar with, uh, uh, for example, just a running stream with rocks in it. Those rocks sort of act as a place for organisms to attach and then grow into biofilms. To the right of that picture is sort of like um, um, a catheter that has been sort of just filled with microbial growth to the point to where it's visible to the eye. The last picture at the top to the right is one that you're very familiar with. It's, it's someone's teeth, un unfortunately, that has a biofilm growing on it. And it looks like they have some periodontal disease going on as well right here. But this is all the beginning of biofilms. They have decided to live as a community and then they grow and grow. They aggravate the soft tissue. And this can get worse and worse until eventually it finds its way into the bloodstream and you no longer have a dental problem, you now have a medical problem. Uh, the next slide down at the bottom to the extreme left kind of shows you a time phase of the growth of biofilm. So in the morning when you get up and brush all of those organisms away in the biofilm, um, you know, they get back to that center picture. They will very gradually grow right back into that jungle looking arrangement that you see. They want to be this. And so the last picture to the right there is sort of just a cartoon to remind me to remind you that uh, a biofilm is not just a very random ordered arrangement of organisms. They know exactly how they want to build this biofilm. And this cartoon can show you, if you take a quick, a closer look at it, that there are different species that have to come in earlier. If we're talking about the oral microbes of, of plaque, they come in early and they set up the, the structure for other organisms to bind to them and then so on and so on. And before you know it, you have a collection of species that are very specifically um, uh, bound to each other to produce what we call plaque. Here's a cartoon that I love just to show you how these microbes go about doing this. And so if you look at um, step number one, you can see that eventually what happens is that um, the organism will approach a surface and they will sort of make these irreversible sensings of that surface to see if they like it or not. And if they do like it, then they will go ahead and move on to step two, three, four and five. But if they don't like it, then what they will still do is sort of what we call condition that surface. They can produce substances that will sort of cause that surface to become a lot more friendly for colonization. And once they do that, then we'll move from step one to two to three to four. See the complexity as it increases from left to right? Eventually, we see uh, some of these microbes either escaping or being allowed to leave. Those are two different things. But anyway, they sort of come out and then they're in position to go and start this process over all somewhere, all again over somewhere else. And so this bioinformation goes on and on. And this is what we saw in some of my very early investigations of biofilm. I'll, I'll point that out when we get to it again. So here's a cross section of um, some biofilm from this organism called NTHI. That stands for non-typable um, Haemophilus influenza. And this is one of the uh, three otopathogens that sort of cause trouble in the middle ear by causing uh, otitis media. A little bit more on that a little bit later, but this is what it sort of looks like growing on a surface. And uh, this electron microscopy was done right here at uh, RIT. So we see then, um, let's see, I've got... Uh, it's kind of covering up some text, but I can get through it. Uh, uh, the, the actual medical uh, ramifications of these biofilms can be very important and they are seriously life threatening. They can cause things like uh, urinary tract infections, uh, bacteremia. Uh, they can colonize soft tissue uh, internal to the body, uh, such as heart valves and cause 
infective endocarditis. They can also cause what we call non-infective endocarditis because they can cause damage to that surface, be cleared out by the host or by some external intervention, but the damage that they cause is still left behind. That is called non-infective endocarditis because the organisms are no longer there. Uh, my interest in this when I came to RIT was the growth of these organisms uh, um, as they get through the eustachian tube and find their way to the middle ear and cause an infection. This is called otitis media, with media meaning middle. Um, dental plaque is something that I sort of brought with me from my uh, days at UAB, uh, three and a half years in the, studying oral microbes there. Uh, we understand very, very well how cavities are formed and how they can lead to periodontal disease and eventually to endocarditis. Now, as a population, we're already suffering pretty uh, heavily from cardiac um, diseases, but this sort of adds to uh, that already growing concern. Now, where Andre's work and ours kind of meet in one place here is that biofilms can really set up conditions to where they can be increased resistance to antibiotics. Just by growing as a biofilm, they can actually be as much as a thousand times more resistant to antibiotics than they would be if they were planktonic or just free swimming. So that's a huge advantage to survival within a particular location if that's where they're at. Uh, they can also be very resistant to clearance by the host immunity because if they have this very thick, sticky, ooey gooey, for lack of a better term, of exopolysaccharide material covering them, then phagocytes and other cells of the immune system will have a hard time getting at the bacteria because they're living beneath this layer of exopolysaccharide material. And that just makes things much more difficult for them to clear. That's why they tend to hang around so long. Well, one of the problems with using antibiotics uh, is that uh, they don't penetrate this polysaccharide encasement very well. Um, and so there's incomplete penetration of the biofilm. So you're really not getting you know, too far when you're using antibiotics. Um, the antibiotics themselves um, you know, just attach to the, to, the, to the layer of the biofilm. And that's really not helping anything. But while the organisms are actually living within the biofilm encasement themselves, they can actually undergo um, a lot of physiological differences that allow them to even further survive uh, the conditions that they're living in when they're in this biofilm. Um, there is some phenotypical uh, uh, pro programs that the organism at the genetic level to be able to live in these biofilms as well. So as you can see, just from that, they present quite the challenge in from the body. Well, some of the work that I started doing at, at uh, RIT when I first came uh, sort of involved um, looking at catheters, uh, I was doing this work uh, in con conjunction with uh, Rochester Regional Hospital. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was request that I could get some catheters from them that were, were put in correctly, did their job, and they were taken out within the time they were supposed to be taken out. And so they should still be sterile if that's the case. And so what we did was we actually took some of those uh, catheters, and one here is a biliary catheter, and we took a look at that using scanning electron microscopy. And you can see number one, it's no big secret that those edges of the catheters are not really smooth, but you don't feel that. Uh, but as it turns out, you can see the other surface here is literally colonized with microbial growth. That's what that is when we grew it out and identified it. Um, as I continued on with my study of biofilms, uh, I looked at uh, the middle ear uh, and the, uh, and the um, uh, propensity of these organisms to cause otitis media. And so what you see here in an infant is sort of like a different uh, shape and size of the head you can see that the eustachian tube is almost um, horizontal, pretty much. But as you get older, your head sort of gets longer and all of that internal structure kind of begins to stand up and make it a little bit more difficult for adults to have otitis media. Although they can have it, it's usually a condition that you see in, in kids. The bottom picture here, here is to help you understand that what I'm getting at is that there is a micro environment that is created during otitis media. And I begin to wonder, is this micro environment sort of uh, encouraging organisms to produce biofilm? And to the top, you'll see that this is just uh, a near, just a, a clear um, middle ear, nothing there. But here you see this buildup of fluid. And as this fluid builds up, uh, the eustachian tube has pinched closed due to inflammation. And so it really can't escape very well. If organisms are growing in a very rich fluid, then they are very well changing that uh, uh, micro environment. And so you may say, well, they're probably going acidic because that's what bacteria do. You know, when they grow and, and produce these different byproducts, they tend to make things acidic. And I would agree with that. But in this case, it seems that uh, they actually made the environment alkaline. And so when we presented this at a conference, uh, most people, you know, just didn't believe what we were saying. And so I was like, OK, well, we've got a little bit more work to do. And as you know, it takes three uh, legs to hold a stool up. So that was our first leg. So we had to go back and work on the other two. The second leg that we found to hold this up was that when we actually went back and found a group of kids and performed this procedure called tympanocentesis, 
The fluid is actually drawn right out of the middle ear uh, with a needle. And we immediately tested that uh, fluid, uh, you know, right as that needle came out of, out of the ear and the pH tended to be alkaline. In fact, it was eight and 8.5, sometimes nine and 8.5. Never did we ever see anything that was acidic. And so we did this for about maybe uh, 56 um, uh, patients. And so we began to get the hint that this fluid is actually alkaline and that alkalinity may actually have something to do with inducing bowel formation, at least in middle ear infections. What I have on the other side of the blue line here is, is one of our very early investigations. We actually took some isolates that had been isolated from middle ear uh, patients and we really made some, some big dilutions on them so that there would be just a few organisms to be able to settle in the bottom of this 96 well well that you're looking at right now. And, and if that is true, they should be able to make some micro colony formation very easily. And as you can see, they actually did. All of these little areas that you see here are just a few organisms that settle together or either by themselves. And they were actually able to make a micro colony, which is almost synonymous with the colony that you see on a Petri plate, if you were to streak one correctly. The bottom picture is just um, a, a color inversion, just to see if you could see that a little bit better. So we were off to a good start with this. We had our pH uh, of eight, primarily coming out of the middle ear fluids. We had already shown in some of our own assays that these organisms prefer to make um, biofilms at pH eight. And so here we see again some biofilm close up. You can see the micro colonies. You can see the other organisms that either are escaping or they were never part of the biofilm in the first place. But certainly you can see the actual biofilms themselves. And then the uh, color inverted image is, is uh, to the right in, in case this picture doesn't seem to well, work too well with your eyes. You can see it better maybe with some blue. And then here's another picture. No, that's not Mickey Mouse. That's just a, a two, uh, a bunch of uh, organisms that have made micro colonies that have formed into each other and they kind of look like that. But here's our color inversion of that. So here's what the biofilm actually looks like with, within THI, uh, either with color inverted or just black and white. So this is getting interesting. And so we can see again with some other ones, uh, we, can, we start to look at things like, well, what does oxygen have to do with anything? Uh, and we, we sort of looked at that and we sort of made this micro aerophilic environment, uh, which is just uh, less than the oxygen that you typically would breathe around 21 to 22%. Now, we chopped that all the way down to, to eight to 9% oxygen. And so they had a little bit left, but not a lot, hence the name micro aerophilic. And then we also had uh, the anaerobic conditions where we took away all of the oxygen to see if that would affect uh, biofilm formation at all. And it looks like it didn't. It looks like with this particular strain of NTHI, they, it may have actually enhanced biofilm formation. Now that sort of made us wonder, does the middle ear ever go completely anaerobic at some point in time? And so we got mixed reviews when we talked to the, uh, the pediatricians who studied this and some would sort of say, well, yeah, maybe it could. And others would say, well, no, it, it really doesn't. What we, what we uh, lined up on was the fact that the fluid, which tended to be very thick, may have provided sort of a level of thickness to where you could have little pockets here and there that were anaerobic. And then you would also get a more robust biofilm formation. So that's, that's what we ended up um, believing in the end. And, and you'll see that we'll prove that a little bit later. Well, the catheter study that we did also uh, used uh, central, venous, central venous catheters, uh, biliary catheters, triple lumen. We had a total of 24 of these. And I'll focus on just a few of them in this uh, presentation. I was trying to keep it within the time I had to present. Uh, but what we asked them to do was actually uh, take these catheters out of patients and get them to us without contaminating them. And then once we got them, we put them into what is called brain heart infusion broth, which is a very uh, rich medium that will grow almost anything that you put into it. I did say almost anything that you put into it. And so uh, you, then we would incubate this for uh, 24 hours at 37 degrees with 5% CO2. Then we streak it out on um, uh, blood auger plate and then get some pure cultures going and then sort of identify them and then freeze them down in case we needed to work with them a little bit later, which we did. So here's what we found. Out of those catheters that were supposedly uh, taken out within the time that they were supposed to be, and they were not contaminated from the time of removing them to time to getting to us. This is what we found in, in uh, central venous catheters. Um, there were some variable times within the patients, but they were all within the guidelines that they were supposed to be in. Uh, so what we found are some troubling organisms. Here's Klebsiella pneumoniae, an organism that is known to be producing a lot of very thick material in its growth. We found it again, and then we found methicillin resistant staph aureus. That's a a serious nosocomially acquired organism that we kind of like to avoid if we can. And then we see Citrobacter frondii, Klebsiella pneumoniae again, and then Hafnia alvei, uh, Enterobacter cloacae, E. coli. And so there's a, a handful of organisms that we were that able to identify on catheters that were said to be in good shape. And from a clinical standpoint, um, you know, you could say, well, the, the patient never developed bacteremia or sepsis or anything along those lines. 
And I could balance that by saying, well, yes, uh, that's why we have to get these catheters out in, in the time that is suggested. And, and luckily, uh, all of those patients avoiding any type of secondary complications as a result of it. But there was potential there, and that's, that still is troubling. Well, some of the present concerns about uh, antibiotic resistance, I can say, is that at some point in everybody's uh, time, you're going to need the services of medicine. You're going to have to go to the doctor for something. And uh, if that is a procedure that's done that may tend to be uh, invasive or it may involve some cutting or maybe you were burned or what have you, uh, all of these uh, breaks in the skin uh, present themselves as opportunities for organisms to grow uh, in a biofilm forma uh, format. Right now, we're having problems with, with people who have diabetic foot ulcers. And a lot of the infections that they have, guess, guess what those infections are? They're, they're biofilm formatted organisms, and so they're tough to get rid of. Um, there are only about maybe five large pharmaceutical companies that still really invest in antimicrobial research uh, today. And the reason for that is that, you know, by the time you spend the millions that it takes to identify um, an antibiotic and bring it to market and to a pharmacy near you, what happens is that within the next few years, organisms are already resistant to that. So the companies haven't even recouped the money they spent to get it to market yet. And so uh, that looks like it's a game that, that a lot of our uh, companies realize that you lose in. You may come out better making a, um, a high blood pressure medication or something along those lines rather than, than deal with the antibiotics. And that's unfortunate. Um, the other thing is that um, a lot of the small um, uh, uh, companies, uh, mid-sized enterprise companies are the ones that are sort of rebreathing oxygen, if you will, into, into the life of the antibacterial drug innovation. Uh, it is those small companies that are really doing that. Um, according to the director of the World Health Organization, we find that uh, antimicrobial resistance is a global health. It's not just a United States thing. This is a global health emergency. I put that in, in red and I uh, bolded it and made it bigger print. It's, it's an emergency. And the reason we say it's an emergency is because <clears throat> if we don't do anything about this, we will be right back to where we were before we actually discovered antibiotics in the first place. And that's not going to be a great place to be. Um, but not having uh, the pipeline of antibiotics that we really need is really putting a serious uh, 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 jeopardy within modern medicine. Many of the drugs that we use now are sort of uh, uh, modifications of previous drugs. And so that's, it's good to have that, but at the same time, it's really just a, a short game. We really need some, some long-term resolutions to this, uh, but we'll take the short until we can get the long. That's really what we're doing now. Um, antibiotic misuse kind of still continues and includes the use of antibiotics by people with viral infections like the you know cold or the flu or something, and they, you really don't need an antibiotic for that. I think the people that are still prescribing those antibiotics are, are coming from the standpoint that we know that if it's an upper respiratory tract infection, if you have a, a viral infection, it's very likely that it's going to be, be followed up by some bacterial infection. I think that might be uh, the reasoning behind them giving you antibiotics for an organism that we're still arguing about whether or not they're living or dead, viruses, I mean. And so... This antibiotic misuse really includes the use of antibiotics for people with these infections. Uh, and it also is, is a, a problem from people using antibiotics in the, uh, the animal growth industry, where it's known that sometimes antibiotics can stimulate the growth of animals and you sort of get a larger animals and that turns into profit. Uh, so that sort of needs to stop as well. Um, and then sometimes uh, there are people that use antibiotic to prevent diseases uh, from happening in healthy animals so that they don't have to end up uh, losing those animals before they take them to market. Um, a lot of this happens on farms. It washes into our water system and sort of further promotes the production of resistance to antibiotics. And so it's a really uh, a big problem. What I left here is something that uh, I think these slides will be made available to you. But I, what I did was I left this CDC slide here to give you some things to know about antibiotic resistance. It's very short. It's only five of them, but they're, but they're very important. So I'll let you take a look at those um, at your own time. So what I'd like to do now is, is leave you with this picture uh, that sort of says it all. Uh, but before I, I say anything about this, uh, let me say thank you to all the students over the years that have helped me to, to do this. They've gone on into medical programs and a few of them have graduated already. I've been here long enough for that to be true. And so I want to say thank you to all of those people, all of the people that actually uh, made funds available for the research externally as well as um, on campus. So, so I do want to acknowledge that. But what this picture is doing, this is one I want, I want you to go to bed with tonight is one that says uh, all of these different looking microbes are different in and of themselves, but look at what they're doing with these arrows. They're sort of passing antibiotic resistance back and forth among themselves, whether they're the same species or not. And so this is what happens in a community. They're all sort of collected right there and protected by that uh, light green material that you see. That's the exopolysaccharide. So they're kind of held together 
And so they can pass resistance genes among them while they're together like this. And in fact, they can become even a little bit more sophisticated about it. The enterococci can produce what is known as pheromones. And pheromones are, are they're almost like a very, uh, very um, nice smelling perfume that sort of draws you to where the source of this perfume is at. And then once you get there, you can make the trade of antibiotic resistance genes. And so um, I can remember a time when we all were so afraid that one day that methicillin resistant staph aureus would bump into um, gentamicin uh, resistant enterococci and they would swap genes and now both of them are resistant to both of those antibiotics. And so I can remember, you know, living in fear like the rest of the microbial community with this, but eventually it happened. And guess what? We now have strains that are resistant to both of those. So this is sort of what's going on from a biofilm standpoint. In my lab, this is what we study now. Um, in addition to um, looking at organisms that can also uh, kill other organisms. And so we found one that's called Streptococcus salivarius K12 bliss. Well, that's a mouthful, but really what we're talking about is just Streptococcus salivarius. Um, the BLIS stands for bacteriocin-like inhibitory substance. And this uh, research was sort of um, uh, modeled out to our students by a very catchy phrase. We called it fight night in the lab. And so <laughs> and students would come to the, to the laboratory ready to work on this because, you know, it sort of created this excitement. And so we found that this organism is actually able to kill all of the uh, microbes in the mouth that cause cavities and also some of the organisms that cause uh, periodontal disease. We also found that this organism kills uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a, a tough guy. It's really hard to get rid of sometimes. What I did with that uh, uh, lane of research was I sort of put it on hold just for now because I've got to find some facilities to pit uh, my heavyweight champion of Streptococcus salivaris K12 bliss. I want to pit it up against some strains that really need to be eradicated, like Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This organism still continues to be... Um, uh, about 33% of the world's uh, uh, infection for, for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I've got to get to some facilities that will let me put K12 bliss up against mycobacterium tuberculosis and, and see who's going to win that. Uh, my money is on K12 bliss. So uh, with that, I want to leave the floor open for some questions that you may have about biofilms and what I'm doing, or even all the way back to some of the work that Andre's doing. It's, it's, it's open for everything now. So, so let's hear it. Thank you very much, you. Dr. Osgood. So we, we do have one question from Andrew. He says, uh, how much of initial biofilm formation after the pellicel, pellicel is an active process? Are the bacteria sticking to the pellicel through ligand, I'm, I'm butchering this, I'm sorry, ligand binding or electrostatic interactions? Okay, I think what you're saying is that, how, uh, the question is how much of the binding of uh, the organisms that started the biofilm is due to the uh, exopolysaccharide saccharide material? I'm thinking that's the question. He says yes, that is what he's asking. Okay, I, I figured you were waiting for the, for the answer from him, so yes. So what happens is that these organisms, uh, there are certain conditions that they that they like to bind to, they, they, they prefer to bind to, but every now and then uh, they can come up on a surface that really isn't all that friendly for binding. And so they have to fix that. And the way they fix that is to secrete conditioning material. And this conditioning material is not always the same thing. It just depends on which environment you're in. If you're talking about in the urinary tract, that's gonna be different from what you'll find in the oral cavity or different what you'll find in the bloodstream. So they take what they have that's available to them and they will somehow use that to make that um, area more friendly and conducive to binding. And so, yes, I would say about maybe 20% uh, of um, their effort is, is, is put toward this because steps two, five can't happen until step number one is happened. Did that answer your question? We're gonna, let's see here. Yes, he said yes, thank you very much. Good. All right. A uh, quick question from Jim Perkins. Can either of you comment on the use of bacteriophages as antibiotics? Okay. Uh, maybe I should go first, uh, uh, if you don't mind, Andre. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I'm thinking, and that's an excellent question, Jim, I, and this notion of using uh, bacteriophage to kill bacteria is nothing new. I believe, from all of my readings, I believe the Russians put this on the table back in the early 50s or somewhere uh, along the lines, and, and it worked up to a point until the body started realizing that, hey, these bacteriophages are foreign. They're not supposed to be here. Let's get rid of them. And so when that happened, the bacteriophages were no longer around to be able to do what they were intended to do, which was kill bacteria. 
So, but this use of uh, bacteriophage nowadays, this is very, very new lately here that, that it's back on the table again. And uh, if we can circumvent that problem, uh, and one of the things I was thinking about, I was talking to a student last semester or somebody about this, and, and I said one of the ideas that I think that may need to happen is that these bacteriophage may have to be purposely uh, engineered so that they don't really have a foreign look to them. Either cloak them with something that looks like it's part of the body or get rid of what the body is really zoning in on to let the body know that this is foreign material. If we could I think we might would have an excellent um, a tool again back on the table that would be useful. They're, as you know, they're very specific to bacteria and even certain bacteria that they're specific for. So uh, I would be excited to see that, um, you know, get online again. Um, I hope I didn't ramble and go off, off point too much, but uh, but that's the idea. I love the idea of a bacteriophage. We just got to get around the problem of it being recognized by the body as foreign. I mean, that's a great point. And also, you know, bacteria kind of developed you know, the CRISPR mechanism that everyone is here about now, which is uh, the, the kind of bacterial way of having its own innate immunity, is to basically take viral nucleic acids, RNA or DNA, or DNA, and basically embed them in its own genome so it could recognize those viruses or phage later in order to destroy it. So I agree with Rob that we will need to have a mechanism where it has to be designed where it's not um, it's not a flag and recognized by the bacteria for destruction. Terrific. And uh, Crystal Thompson asked, I think, the, the $64,000 question, which is, uh, what do you think would be a good solution in developing new antibiotics since bacterial infections become resistant so quickly? Um, well, I, I, I think the issue is that we could do a lot of stewardship. For example, uh, if, I think if you come up with a regimen of rotating drugs or rotating bacteria, so you're not constantly exposing the same bacteria um, or bacterium to the same drug over and over again to kind of develop antibiotics. The other stewardship issue is that, for example, a lot of people are not completing their courses. So what happened is that they will take antibiotics for a couple of days, feel better, and then decide not to finish the course. What that does is, is basically you're under exposing the bacterial infection and basically basically priming it to develop antibiotics, right? So there is stuff in animal husbandry, as uh, Dr. Osgood mentioned. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of stewardship involved in the in 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 addition to kind of finding novel targets and novel um, so forth. But you know, evolution. Um, you know, kind of take care of itself. And so no matter how much drugs that we come up with, my guess is that over time, you're gonna see resistant build up. Not only bacteria, but plants do it, humans do it, a lot of organisms. Um, it's just a natural um, phenomenon. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that, uh, Andre. It is, it is a natural phenomenon, uh, but the use of antibiotics seems to have sped up the evolution of this resistance. Uh, they have to do it for survival. Uh, uh, they have to, to do this. So I think uh, you know some of the things that may be uh, useful to look at would be to study uh, what the responses of bacteria are to antibiotics. If we could get that complete picture of, of what's produced, what did you do when you ran into this antibiotic? How are you getting ready to develop resistance? Maybe those are the new targets uh, you know, that we can take a look at if, if they aren't looking at those already. I'd be surprised if they weren't. Um, but um, I think there's still some room for, for innovation in this area of antibiotic resistance. Um, but uh, right now, what we're doing is, is starting to fail us a bit. And so we've got to, to get really in a hurry to get this fixed. And all the readings that I do, uh, you know, between the stop signs and red lights and all these, these places, uh, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is, is that people are starting to predict now that if we don't get this um, corrected, then, you know, by the year 20. Uh, 65, 2070 or something like that, we may very well be looking at having an infection, but not having anything to use to help clear it up. And there are some people that are in that position already. Uh, I mean, recently there was, um, was a, a woman in, wa in Washington state somewhere who was infected with a um, bacterial infection that she got when she went zip lining and got a cut on her hands and yeah. went into the water and got infected. And they tried 23 antibiotics and not a single one of them was able to um, kill this particular bacteria. She ultimately died from it. And the reason is, it's and, and some of these um, antibiotics were very toxic. We're talking about stuff that's what we call last resort. Like, I mean, they, 
they messes up your liver, their kidneys, and we talk about like very, very toxic stuff. And this one particular species was resistant to every single antibiotic that was available um, in the healthcare system. So that tells you that um, there's it's very, very serious. Yeah. Well, we do have to wrap up here because we are a little over. I know we do have a couple of questions that we will forward to Dr. Osgood and Hudson uh, so that you do get the answers to your questions. Um, but we do want to thank uh, both of our guest speakers as well as our audience for your patience while we were uh, trying to work out some technical issues. Um, but um, we do appreciate them sharing their insights and uh, please visit rit.edu slash alumni slash tigers dash staying dash home for a listing of our other upcoming virtual events. We do have several webinars in the coming weeks and we'd like to include you in as many as possible. Please exit the webinar by simply closing the live storm window and please do let us know what you thought of the webinar through a brief survey that you will receive via email. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend and please stay healthy.